If you remember spending hours running around Hogwarts, aimlessly wiggling your wand around, and slowly climbing ledges, then you grew up playing Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. But which one? Because there were three completely different versions of this game released across 11 different platforms, and in this video we're going to compare each of them. By 2007, the Harry Potter games had gone through a couple of permutations. The first three games focused on exploration and adventure, and would go on to become fan favourites. Then, Goblet of Fire came and changed things up a bit. It, got me with its stingers. it was a lot more of an actual movie tie-in game, and it changed the gameplay to focus on level-based multiplayer. The reception for that game wasn't great, so WB and EA decided to return to the open world exploration format. And what better time to do it than at the start of the very first high definition console generation. So how did they do? Well, let's start with the PlayStation 3, 360 and PC version. Just like the movie, the game opens up with Harry getting into trouble for the use of underage magic to protect himself and Dudley against a Dementor attack. This is followed by the Grimmauld play sequence, which acts as a tutorial section for this game. You're not at the Dursleys now. You're allowed to use magic. Hold on, didn't he just get into trouble for using magic? I'm beginning to see why you did time in Azkaban, Sirius. So this game's big gimmick is casting spells with the right analog stick instead of just pressing a button. Each spell has a different shape or pattern you have to follow. All right, let's give it a try. What the? It looks like Harry's arms lost all of its bones again. Come on, come on. Duh. You can do it, Harry. You're the chosen one. The swish and flick. The swish and ah. Oh, Nope, that's it. I'm done. Let me out, Sirius. Hello, Hamora. Hello, f***ing Hamora. You know what? Now I understand why Harry is so moody in Order of the Phoenix. I've been playing this for like five minutes and already I want to punch someone. Speaking of which, they definitely turned up Harry's sass to 11 in this game. How was your summer? I bet your summer's been better than mine. Stuck at the Dursley. Lucky I'm gonna get expelled from Hogwarts for stopping a Dementor. Okay, off to Hogwarts, and thanks to this game's enhanced physics engine, we can continue the tradition of abusing Ron. But because this is an open world game, we can now hurt other students as well. Oh, look at Fred and George. They look like a pair of 40 year old pub owners. So Hogwarts is filled with loads of different NPC students and you can actually talk to every one of them. Just don't expect Mass Effect levels of dialogue. Okay, Harry. Hey. Moving on. Oh shit, it's Joe. Act cool, Ron, act cool. Is that a tornado's badge? You don't support them, do you? You prick, what did you do that for? <laughs> Right, let's just get to the common room before you say anything else stupid. Taking this new prefix. Whoa, for what's wrong with this kid? Hey, uh, are you alright there, mate? Any chance I could borrow your history of magic essay? You know what? I don't think I like the way this room's laid out. Let's play The Sims. <laughs> So remember how in the Goblet of Fire video, I said they should have had a Yule Ball level where Harry runs around Hogwarts asking out girls only to get rejected? Well, they kind of did that in this game. Go and play with the mudblood. All right. Potter stinks. To be fair, it wasn't all bad. I can fit 15 chocolate frogs in my mouth. Okay, with that done, it's time to set off for the potions class. But on the way there, we run into Neville being bullied by some Slytherins. Neville, what's wrong with you? You're at least a foot taller than each of these generic NPCs, and your head is twice as wide. Also, why do they give this one guy a seven-year-old's voice? Are you looking at me? Well, I guess we're gonna have to sort these Slytherins out. You know what that means. It's time to do, 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 do it. All right, come on. Come at me, you little shit. I'll f***ing have you. You can tell the developers put a lot of effort into making this version of Hogwarts match the movie. Apparently, they used blueprints from the movie, they scanned the actors' faces, and consulted JK Rowling herself. And it really shows, but what about the gameplay itself? Well, when I interviewed Christo Wichitich, who was the lead designer in the first three games, he talked about the difficulty they had with adapting Harry Potter. The first version of it, frankly, was, was really, really boring. Oh, yeah. um, it was just a walking simulator. We walk around and, and great, it's granted like, you know, the excitement of being able to explore Hogwarts on your own as a third person game was really cool, but it really lacked um, focus. And Order of the Phoenix is kind of a walking simulator for the most part. You're going to spend most of this game going from one end of Hogwarts to another to do some kind of a task. Okay, but what are the tasks? Are you going to be fighting fire breathing salamanders? or being chased by trolls? 
Not exactly. There's one where you have to go to the library and get a book, but someone's left the book on top of the shelf. How's that for an obstacle, huh? I don't understand, why can't I just use the Accio spell, you know, the one they showed in the tutorial, to get the book? Okay, let me get something to climb. Oh, sorry, looks like Ron's finally had enough of my abuse. Alright there, think you can take on the chosen one. So the trio find the room of requirement and decide to assemble Dumbledore's army. And would you look at how many people have already signed up? Wait, hold on, where are they? Well, they're actually scattered all over Hogwarts, and it's your job to recruit every one of these NPCs. And despite the fact that they've already put their names down, they won't actually join you until you do some kind of a stupid chore or fetch quest for them. For example, Angelina needs you to clean up the trophy room. Uh, you know what? I'm not even going to ask what you were doing here. Okay, uh, Repero. Deposo! Ah, shit. Oh no, Susan Bones is being bullied by Crab and Goyle. Don't worry, Susan, I'll save you. Whoops, sorry. Guess we're gonna have to try the old-fashioned way. Avada Kedavra. <laughs> Works every time. Anyway, back to recruiting. Fred and George will only join the DA if you help them smuggle their illegal contraband. Colin Creevy makes you climb up the castle wall to get his stupid camera. Okay, that's done, but how do I get down? Can I do like a leap of faith? Nope, gotta climb all the way back down. Most of these recruitment tasks are just boring, but some of them actually do my head in. Like having to get this big ball of festral food up the hill for Luna, only for it to keep rolling back down. And then there's also Dean, who sends you all around Hogwarts looking for talking gargoyles. And of course, we've got to recruit Cho. But I forgot to put the address on it, and now the owl's flown up there and won't come down. I'll get it for you. Sim! So this whole recruitment section actually takes up half the game. And I'm not over exaggerating, maybe even more if you're not going to be doing any of the side quests. And as I said, most of it is just running from one end of Hogwarts to another, which is slowed down further by the fact that these damn stairs just won't align. Okay, so once you're done, Harry assembles everyone in the room of requirement and teaches them a few spells. We then get a bit more plot from the movie. Harry sees Mr. Weasley getting attacked. He's then taken to learn legitimate which is just a mini game, and then he's back at Grimmel Place for Christmas. Blood traitors! Um, Ron, is that you? Ah! Yep, that's definitely Ron. Okay, back to Hogwarts, which means we're back to running around the castle. God, I miss broomsticks. Hold on, this game doesn't actually have any Quidditch. You'd think they'd include it, you know, just to break up the monotony. Hmm, maybe they spent all their Quidditch budget on wizard chess and gobstones. Right, so some more plot happens in pre-rendered cutscenes. Dumbledore and Hagrid go on the run. There's a big battle between Dumbledore's army and the Slytherins. You know, it's hard to know who's actually winning. There's no health bar or stats of any sort. Anyway, so things are looking very grim at Hogwarts. Whatever are we going to do? We should find the DA members and make sure they're all right. Oh god, you can't be serious. Nope, that's right, we've got to reassemble Dumbledore's army. Again, who are, you've guessed it, spread all over the castle. Again. And yes, each of them comes with another mini quest. This time, they all revolve around sabotaging Umbridge and her lackeys. We've got things like turning the courtyard into a swamp, helping Dean sabotage the clock. Heads up, giant cog coming through. And then of course we've got more moving benches around, along with more wall climbing. Lots and lots of slow and tedious climbing. I guess now's a good time to mention that Harry can't actually jump in this game. Look, turning a movie into a fun and interesting video game is often the biggest challenge for tie-in game developers, simply because every movie has slower sections that would be very boring if they're adapted into a video game. Some games, like the Phantom Menace tie-in, took the approach of inventing action set pieces in between what's shown on screen. Others, like the older Harry Potter games, inserted quests and dungeons. Order of the Phoenix seems to prioritize the experience of being at Hogwarts over the gameplay itself. I went back over the developer interviews around the time this game came out, and all they talked about was the authenticity and immersion of being at Hogwarts. Also, tie-in games have a very tight development cycle, so I have a feeling that they did plan to have more gameplay, but they just ran out of time. Okay, so after gathering all the DA members and sabotaging the school, you suddenly get to play this broomstick section as Fred and George. 
What? Could it be a fast-paced gameplay element? Well, not really, because you don't actually steer the brooms, and every time you cast a spell, the twins just come to a stop. Well, they tried. Okay, so a bit more plot happens. Umbridge is taken by the centaurs in the forest, which means Harry and his friends can travel to the Ministry of Magic. Oh, do they get to fly the Thestrals? Of course they don't. It's a cutscene. Ooh, Death Eaters, do they get to fight them? No, they just run away. You do get to fight Malfoy and Bellatrix as Sirius Black for about 10 seconds until he's sent beyond the veil. But you do get to fight Voldemort as Dumbledore at point blank range so they clip through each other. And then you finish things off with another legitimacy minigame. Only this time it's against Voldemort. And when you do defeat him, he just stands there Oh, I didn't get to break your mind. Well, I'll be going now. There is a post-game technically, but it mainly consists of you repairing old statues and trying to hang up old paintings. Okay, so what's the verdict on this version? It's tough. Look, I appreciate the amount of work that's been put into making a movie-accurate Hogwarts, but it's a bit of a maze and you'll just end up spending most of the game following these footprints on the floor. It's nice to be able to interact with the students, even if most of them do just end up shouting insults at you. My grand thinks you're barking. It makes Hogwarts feel more like a lived-in place, just don't expect anything beyond the surface here. I also appreciate what they try to do with the gesture-based spell system, System, but if you step away from the game for a bit, you'll just end up forgetting the gestures. And obviously I've already mentioned the lack of actual gameplay. I think the key point here is this game has some really good ideas, but it's just not finished. Okay, let's move on to the other console versions. But before that, I'd like to take a minute to thank NordVPN for sponsoring this video. You know, as someone who spends most of his time sitting behind a computer talking to himself, I take internet safety very seriously. And with NordVPN, your data is protected behind a wall of next generation encryption. And NordVPN servers are ultra fast, so you don't have to make a choice between speed and security. It's summertime. How many times have you gone away on holiday only to start your favorite streaming service and realize the show you started watching isn't available in that country. Well, NordVPN has over 5,000 servers across 59 countries, so you can change your virtual location with a single click and enjoy your favorite show while slowly roasting in the sun. Plus, with its new threat protection feature, NordVPN protects you and your devices from malicious websites, malware, trackers, and intrusive ads, even if you're not connected to a VPN server at the time. Simply go to nordvpn.com flandrew to get your two two-year plan with a huge discount plus one additional month for free. That's nordvpn.com slash flandrew. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Okay, so what about the versions on the other consoles? Well, the Wii is pretty much the same except for, you guessed it, waggle controls. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the whole gesture-based spell mechanic actually originated as a Wii idea and then got ported to the other consoles. The motion controls themselves are pretty decent. Okay, moving on. The PlayStation 2 and 3 games look near identical, and not in a good way. You see, back then it wasn't too uncommon for developers to start with a baseline version and then scale it up or down depending on the hardware. And when you have a game released on so many different platforms, you're kind of going to go with the lowest common denominator, so you can definitely tell the HD versions weren't everything they could have been in terms of graphics, so the game could be easily ported to PlayStation 2 and Wii. And speaking of slight downgrades, here is the PlayStation Portable version. It's pretty much the same as the PS2, but because the PSP only has one analog stick, there are no spell gimmicks here. They're mapped straight onto the buttons. It's just too bad this version looks like a turd. And unfortunately, there are more spells in this game than the PSP has face buttons, so the game quickly resorts to these awkward dual button combinations. Damn it, come on, you shitty pile of clothes. I'd pick you up with my bare hands, but I can't. They didn't program it into the game. A lot of the dynamic spell casting has also been removed which means there's no benches to bludger on with. Shame. But most of the PlayStation 2 version is still intact in this game. I guess you kind of have to hand it to the developers for cramming all of Hogwarts into a UMD, even if everyone looks like a virtual fighter character. Moving on, we have the Game Boy Advance version, which is very faithful to its big brother, for better or worse. This game does the standard GBA thing of taking screenshots from the cutscenes and using them as nice little PowerPoint slides. 
But it goes beyond that. The environments are comprised of pre-rendered backgrounds similar to the old Final Fantasy games on PS1. And when I say pre-rendered, I actually mean screenshots of the environments from the console version. How economical of you, Electronic Arts? And what about the spells? How can you perform them with just a D-pad and two face buttons? Well, first you press the B button, then you get your wand out, then you find an object with the D-pad, then you cast the spell, and then you have to do a little minigame to perform it properly. Simple. Because each section is static, the developers place characters in visible places so you know where to go. But it ends up looking a bit creepy, especially with this music. There's no map in this version, but thankfully the developers added an arrow that pops up every now and then showing you where to go. As I said, this game is pretty faithful to the console version, so there's a ton of walking around, doing benign tasks and fetch quests. This time Hogwarts is eerily empty though. Every now and then you'll run into a student, at least I think that Atari 2600 sprite is a student, and then they'll want to play Exploding Snap with you, and you can't say no. Speaking of which, there are a few mini games in this version, they're mainly reserved for different lessons and the OWL exams. This version also has dueling, and it's turn-based, but there's no real stats or items or any of the intricacies from the older RPG games. You get a few spells, and you can cast them by doing a button combo. The more powerful the spell, the harder and faster the combination. Hey, at least you can see how much health the characters have this time around. So yeah, that's the Game Boy Advance version. It's definitely a Game Boy Advance game. Staying with Nintendo, we have the DS version. It's very similar to the GBA, but it's not a direct copy like Goblet of Fire. There are definitely a lot more enhancements on the DS. Graphics are based off the same pre-rendered backgrounds from the console, but they're slightly higher quality and resolution. And they also seem to use slightly different angles from the Game Boy version. The audio is also better and the game is easier to navigate because of this white hand that's always there in the corner of the screen. Most of the action happens at the bottom of the screen with the top mainly being used for dialogue and objectives. There's a bit more content in this version, more tasks to do and more things to fetch. The Game Boy minigames have been reworked to use the touchscreen. In fact, everything that requires some kind of a button combo in the GBA version has been converted to the touchscreen. Spell casting, minigames and the duels. Another bonus for this version is that it actually has Quidditch. This is the only version of Order of the Phoenix that has Quidditch. At least as far as I could tell, I couldn't find Quidditch on the Game Boy Advance. Overall, this is definitely the superior version. The enhancements make the game a lot more playable compared to the GBA, and the touchscreen minigames are a lot more fun than doing endless button combinations. And finally, we get to the mobile version. I'm going to get a little Inception-y here, but there are actually three different versions of the mobile game. You've got the most basic one, the mid-tier, and the high-end. All three of these versions have very similar gameplay, which consists of battling using the directional pad and then sneaking around levels. There's really not much else to say about these. It's just really fascinating that there are three different versions of this game. And so there we have it, every version of Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. This one really is a bit of a mixed bag for me. I appreciate that they went back to doing open world exploration. And with this being the first game on the HD generation of consoles, it makes sense that they would focus on realizing a full-scale version of Hogwarts. It's just a shame that the actual game portion of this video game is lacking. The good news is, the developers would take this criticism on board for Half-Blood Prince, which expanded on this game in every way, adding Quidditch, enhanced dueling, and a shit ton of potion making. But we'll have to get to that one in the next video. In the meantime, let me know your thoughts on the Order of the Phoenix game in the comments. Which version is your favorite? And where do you rank it amongst the other Harry Potter games. As always, thanks for watching, remember to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.